We're in a series entitled Unexpected Jesus. And um, with this series, we have been walking through uh, different encounters in the life of Jesus to where there were things that were unexpected. And uh, we took a lot of this uh, from, a, from a song that talks about fix your eyes on the unexpected and to ready your heart for the unexpected and then take that next step. And then say, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow your shadow step. And wherever you go, I want to go. But I understand that where, where you take me and where you show up many times will be unexpected. And so each week we've, come, we've been looking at, at a, uh, an encounter in Scripture that points out this unexpected nature. And so today it's, uh, we're talking about an unexpected arrival, an unexpected arrival. Now, probably all of us in our lives have had some unexpected arrivals. Uh, sometimes it's people drop into our house that we didn't know they were coming. Uh, there could be some positive unexpected arrivals that uh, for those who, who just had a baby and they've welcomed a baby into their home and all of a sudden they get this unexpected arrival of Sunday school classes come and bringing food and helping with them and, and volunteer babysitters on there. And so there are a lot of things at times in our life that happen that are uh, unexpected. But, but sometimes we are expecting something and it just doesn't happen. And it's like we have to wait a while, and then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, they arrive. You're glad they're there, but it kind of won the time when you thought they should have been there. And that's what we run into in this story. And this is the story of, of Jesus and Lazarus. And we're going to read this, and it's found in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, we're going to go through this chapter, and let's just read through this and get you an opportunity to capture this whole story, and then we want to break it down and talk about what does it mean about this unexpected Jesus? What does it mean about an unexpected arrival? It says, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, which you'll see this in chapter 12, but as John's writing this, he thinks everybody knows that story. And it says, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So you got Mary and Martha, they got a brother Lazarus, and he was sick. So the sisters sent to uh, Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. And this is what he said to the messenger, and this is what he said to his disciples. And now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. That seems like that makes no sense, but we'll talk about that. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? And if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And after saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. <laughs> then Jesus told them plainly. <laughs> I love that. He told them plainly. Guys, this is the story. Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. And so Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. And so a bold statement of saying, they're after him to kill him. If that happens, we'll die with him. And then it says in verse 17, and when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. And Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and, and she met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. 
And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet. And she said to him the same thing, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And she said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And so the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? And then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb, and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus says, take away the stone. And then Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to, the, to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out. His hands and feet were bound with linen strips, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Bind him and let him go. An unexpected arrival. I want you to write down some of these notes because this will apply for you in your life. If it's not today, it'll be tomorrow, the next week, somewhere along the way because every one of us are going to walk through these times. Number one is this. Jesus arrives later than you expect. Jesus arrives later than you expect. Now, the two sisters expected Jesus to arrive earlier. They sent him a message, and they said, Lazarus, the one that you love, the guy that you're so close to, and when you come in town, you're always hanging at our house, he's really ill, close to death, so we just wanted to let you know. Now, they're sending him that message because what they're wanting is for Jesus to come and come quickly, and then he can come and he can heal him, and they've seen this happen before. And so they're expecting him to come, but he doesn't come. And then all of a sudden, they're, they're thinking, well, he hasn't come uh, personally. Why doesn't he do one of those long-distance miracles? He's done this before. He did that. There was a story of a centurion that came to him, and he said, Jesus, I, I've, I've got a servant who is sick over here. He means a lot to me. Uh, if you would come, and uh, he says, if you could heal him. And Jesus said, well, let me come to your house. He says, you don't have to come to my house. You can just speak the word. And he says, okay. And he says, when you go home, your servant will be healed. Sure enough, he went back, and he was healed. There was earlier in the book of John a nobleman who had a son that was sick, and, and he came to him, and, and Jesus told the nobleman right then and there, do you believe, do you have faith that, that I can heal him? He says, yes, I do. He says, well, head on home. He's feeling better. And sure enough, as he headed home, someone came and met him and said, he's feeling better. He says, what time did it happen? He, he gave him the time. He says, that's the exact same time I was talking to Jesus. So he could do one of those spoken uh, miracles, but that didn't happen. And then he died. And so when Lazarus died, they then wrapped his body up, and they had the funeral. He didn't even show up for the funeral. So he wasn't there to heal him. He didn't do a long-distance miracle. He didn't show up for the funeral. And now they're in the midst of five days of mourning, and he hadn't been there. And when he gets the message, it says he specifically said, let's wait a couple days, and then we're going to head our way to, uh, to Bethany. And don't you know that during those few days that Mary and Martha are standing on the road waiting for him, looking, saying, I'm positive this is the direction that he's going to come, but he didn't come. Probably in their mind, they're thinking, he's out there somewhere doing miracles for other people. He's healing other people. He's giving sight to these folks. He's taking the lame and letting them walk, and they're perfect strangers, and we're friends of his. So why doesn't he do a miracle for us? I mean, we're as committed as it can be. We're as close to him as can be. But yet he's out there doing stuff for other people, and he's not doing anything for us. We're in critical need of his help. Why would Jesus abandon them in their hour of need? And so all of these things have happened, and then all of a sudden, four days later, here comes Jesus. Four days later. 
And when he came, both Mary and Martha, who had been talking throughout this whole uh, ordeal, said the exact same thing. If you'd only been here sooner, my brother would not have died. If you'd only showed up sooner, my brother would not have died. You arrived later than we expected. James Dobson wrote a book a number of years ago called When God Doesn't Make Sense. He took a paragraph in there describing um, this passage. Let me read this to you. He says, isn't this characteristic of the Christian life? Haven't you noticed that Jesus usually shows up about four days late? He often arrives after we have wept and worried and paced the floor, after we have sweated out the medical examination or fretted our way through business reverses. And if he had arrived on time, there could have avoided much of the stress that occurred in his absence. You know, there seems to be a number of times in our lives where it seems that Jesus is about four days late. And I think we've all experienced it. It would have been so much easier if he'd have showed up when I wanted him to show up. But however, in the case of Lazarus, Jesus arrived at the precise moment necessary to fulfill the purposes of God, and that is true today. He responds to you and to me the same way in our lives, right on time. Let me give you some sub points to look at this. Number one, God's timing is perfect even when he appears late. God's timing is perfect even when he appears late. From our standpoint, we think he's appearing late, but his timing is perfect. It is extremely important for us to recognize that Jesus is never actually late. His timetable for action is different from ours. God's economy of time and energy are very different from ours. No doubt, his timing will frequently be later than we would have chosen. However, from his divine perspective, it is the right time. God created time, thus he knows how to keep his appointments. So the one that created time knows everything about time. He understands time, and he always keeps his appointments. And so we need to understand this, first of all, is that God's timing is perfect, even to us when he appears late. Number two is that God's ways involves delayed expressions of love. God's ways involve delayed expressions of love. And whenever God delays, it's never due to desertion or destitution, but it's due to an overwhelming love that he has for us. Because you see, God's love for us is not a pampering love, but a perfecting love. He doesn't have a pampering love to where he tries to meet every little, little need or want or desire that we have. It's not a pampering love, but it's a perfecting love, which at times means that we will experience discomfort and pain. We understand this as parents. As good and godly parents, we have a better understanding about life and life situations so that sometimes when our children come to us and make a request, we have to tell them no or we have to tell them wait. And from a child's perspective, usually as children, and we all did this growing up, we get mad, we get upset, we say, you don't love me, you're making life difficult on me, and on and on and on. When it actually is a parent, we're saying, we do know what's best for you, and you need to wait on this one, or you need to go no on this one. And there'll be some discomfort and pain because you're, I'm having to say no to you right now, but I'm saving you from a whole lot in the future. You just got one of those things where it says you got to trust me. And so as earthly parents, we understand this with our children. And so hopefully as believers and with a heavenly father who has so much a greater love and knowledge than we as earthly parents, that there will be times when he says, I love you so much that I've got to delay this. I've got to give you a no or give you a wait. So let me tell you two things about God's delays. Number one, his delays are inevitable. God's delays are inevitable. Since we are finite creatures, we're largely unaware of the circumstances which surround the events that take place in our lives and those of others, as well as the consequences that will result from them. God is omniscient. He sees the whole picture, and we don't. You know, we, we, we don't even have that 30,000 uh, 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 30, mile view or something, a foot, feet, a view of everything. I mean, we, we, we don't see that. But yet what happens is that God comes up and he sees the whole plan. And when he sees the whole plan, oftentimes we're saying, God, I need you to do this. I need it right now. And then he says, just hold on. Just hold on. And he does this 
because he loves us. God is omniscient. You know, whenever you're seeking theological truths, most people go to the movie Rudy. Uh, and, um, you know, e- even, even in, that, in that movie when you're, when you're just dealing with difficulties. And, and you know about, you know, Rudy, he's, he's trying to get the opportunity to try to get into Notre Dame, but his grades aren't good, so he goes to a junior college. And each time he finishes a semester, he, he sends in his application, see if Notre Dame will accept him. And they say, no, 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 no. And, and unless he is a Unless he gets accepted, he can't do his dream of trying to walk on there and play football. And so his very last semester, uh, he completes his grades, and he sends it in. It's his last chance. And he's sitting there in the chapel, and, he, and, he's, and he's praying, and the priest comes in, and he, and he asks him the question. He says, is there anything more I can do, anything else I can do? And, uh, and he talks about praying. He says, I've been praying. And he looks at the priest and says, can you help me? And he says, in my 35 years of theological training, there are two incontrovertible truths. They are these. There is a God, and I'm not him. (laughs) And he says, you just got to trust him. You just got to trust him. Delays are inevitable, but number two is this, is that God's delays are not final. God's delays are not final. We need to understand that anytime God delays, it does not mean he does not love us. But we do know that the delays are not final. There are times it seems that God will never answer our prayers. We just can't understand because we know we've prayed for God's will. We've prayed for his direction. We've prayed for the situation to be resolved. So what should we do? We should wait in faith, knowing that God has our best interest in mind. We may wait four days, maybe four weeks. We may wait four months. We may wait four years. And then all of a sudden, God gives an answer. Sometimes it's the answer we want. Sometimes it's the answer that we don't want, and he answers it in an altogether different way. And we may find that God's final answer is no. But whatever the case, God will come in his own time, in his own way, and his decision will be best, and his timing will be right. Our Lord's purpose for us is not to make us happy, but to make us holy. Our God's purpose is not just to make us happy and to give us everything that we want exactly the time that we want it, and then we say, God, I'm so happy. No, his his really purpose is to make us holy. And so in order to make us holy, it may mean that I don't get everything I want at every time that I need. What he's looking for is a deeper joy than just surface happiness and just temporary happiness. And you say, well, why does he desire to make us holy? It's because he loves us too much to keep us just partway sanctified, to keep us just partway transformed. He desires our holiness. And since suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope, we may expect him in his love to allow things in our lives which we ourselves would exclude. He will allow things to come into our lives which we would say, I don't think I want that. He said, I'm going to allow this to come into your life because I love you and because I want to develop that holiness. C.S. Lewis made an amazing statement. He says, we are not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We are wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. (laughs) We're not necessarily doubting that God will do the best for us. We're wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. Now, as you read that statement, you look at that statement for a while, you go, oh, that's kind of negative there. I don't, I don't know if I want the best. Listen, pain is just a part of our life if we want to excel at anything, isn't it? If you want to excel in a particular calling that you've been given, whether it be, let's say it's a doctor or, or a lawyer or a nurse or whatever, there's a lot of pain that goes in there. There's a lot of late nights. There's a lot of sacrifices uh, to be able to, uh, to get the knowledge that you need to invest that time in order to get the credentials to pursue what you want. If you're wanting to be in a craft and you take some craft, there's a lot of pain involved. There's a lot of mistakes that you make. There's a lot of, of back and forth and giving of your time. If you want to excel in some physical challenge and you're trying to get physically fit to do something, there's always pain because somewhere there's a sign in some gym that says no pain, no gain, right? And we know that's true. And we know that is true. And so why not in our spiritual lives? We can't get soft and flabby in our spiritual lives and think everything's going to be fine. There is some pain that will come around. And C.S. Lewis says, we're not doubting that God's going to do the best for us. We're just wondering how painful the best will turn out to be. Because there will be some pain. 
But you know, in the scripture, it talks about that. It talks about how you've got the, uh, the potter and the clay, and it says that we're like being molded by this clay. Now, if you're that, that clay, that's kind of painful. Somebody's got their, their hands on you, and they're squeezing you, and they're moving you, and they're stretching you, and, and doing on all this stuff. And, and, and then they're spinning you around and putting you in a fire. I mean, all these things. And then he talks about being refined as to fire. You take the metal, and we want the metal to be as pure as it can be, so we put it in the fire to get rid of the dross and all the bad elements, and we check it out again, and we put it back in there. All of that is pain. And he says, I do all this for perfection and for holiness. And so God does want the best for us. But when you look at that final product, you see the purity of the metal, or, or, or you see that, that piece of pottery that is just perfect, and you say, it's all well worth it. It's all well worth it. And that's where God has got that view up here to where he says, I understand you and I understand life situations. And sometimes you want me to come right now, and I can't come right now. Now, my presence is always around you, but I cannot come with the answers that you're looking for. You got to go just a little bit longer. You got to go the four days. Give me the four days. And then the answer will be there. Number two is this. Jesus arrives at the peak of your pain, and he sympathizes with your hurt. Jesus arrives at the peak of your pain, and he sympathizes with your hurts. In this passage, in, in verse 17, he says that when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb uh, for four days. Said, what happens during those days is whenever someone dies, then uh, mourners, professional mourners will come in, and they will weep with the family for about five days. Now, I don't want that to be on my resume, personally. I just don't want to do that. But, um, but some of the people, they're professional mourners. And they would come in, and they'll say, we're going to sit with the family. We're going to weep with you and cry with you for those five days. There was a traditional belief among Jewish people that day that whenever a person died, and now as you listen to what I'm getting ready to tell you, this was a Jewish traditional belief. This was not Scripture. It was a Jewish traditional belief that when a person died, that their soul would hover above their body for three days. And by the time you got to the fourth day, it was completely hopeless because decomposition began to take place in the body, and so it was the most hopeless, helpless day in all the mourning process. That would be day four. What day did Jesus show up? Day four. At the peak of their pain, to where the mourners kick into higher gear the intensity of their weeping. And even if you were sitting there holding on to hope to some Jewish traditional belief, even that is gone. And in the peak of your pain, at that fourth day, this is when Jesus has arrived. See, the reality of his presence will be there when you most need it. He will be there. And then his response to this illustrates both the human and divine natures that he has. Because in verse 33, if you look in verse 33, he comes in, uh, and it, it says that when Jesus saw Mary, she came, and when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He was deeply moved, which means that when Mary came and she's crying and he sees all the other people crying, all of a sudden he begins to be deeply moved in his spirit. Now, it's interesting. You read different commentaries and different ways that people have translated this word deeply moved, and it goes one, from one extreme to the other. Some believe it means pain. Some believe it means anger. I like it when they say it's a mingling of the two, that there's pain and there's anger. We understand pain and anger. I mean, just a while back when there's that school shooting at Parkland School in Florida, and, and, and all of a sudden, you, you looked on TV and you, you saw the moms and the dads and the brothers and sisters who'd lost a family member. You wept for them and your heart went out for them. And there was pain. But then there was also anger as to how could something like this happen? And so you can understand the co-mingling of both pain on one hand and yet anger at the other hand for those that, have, that did this for, this, uh, for the guy that did this. And for Jesus, he is looking there, and he is commingling this pain and anger. 
There's the pain of, I see them weeping and sorrowful, and I understand what death is. There's the anger because he understands that the effect of sin is what causes death. And that the one who has the power of death at that time was Satan himself, who was, who was, the, uh, who was the prince of the world. And because of the sin that, that was created at the beginning when Adam and Eve and when they first ate of that fruit, and then it says sin entered the world, we became a fallen creation. And when a fallen creation, then the effects of sin, you see it. And Jesus is standing there and he's seeing that the creation that he had, had made uh, at the beginning that was to have this perfect fellowship with God. And, and now to see what this looks like because sin has come in and, he, and he's looking around and he's seeing people mourning and he, he's thinking about Lazarus and the pain he went through that led up to his death and then his death. And then he just thinks about death itself and how that was so unnecessary and it's the cause of sin and that Satan's the one that's behind all of this. And with all of that, there's an anger over here and then there's a pain over here. But he also realizes that just in a short while, he's going to the cross and he's going to defeat Satan once and for all. And so all these emotions are with him. And it says that Jesus wept. And everybody knows that. Man, that John eleven thirty five. 35, every child Jews that is a favorite Bible verse from time and memoriam. All right? We were so thankful it was placed in there as a young boy. Because <laughs> whenever they got asked that question, that was the first thing you said. If I could get my hand up first, I'd be the first one. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. Got it. All right. And it's just that small verse, but it packs so much power into it because he understands us. He relates to us. And he felt that. And he wept with those who were weeping. Right there, weeping with those who were weeping. He felt the misery of those that are hurting. And even in that shortest verse in the Bible, he was feeling our pain and he was troubled. And it says here in verse 33, when he saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, agitated, okay? This is, when you read this story, you'll see different aspects, but never lose the aspect that, that Jesus understands our pain and that um, he is not a detached spectator. So whenever you're going through tough times, and you're there in your room, and you're screaming out to God saying, you just don't understand. He does. <laughs> he does understand. And he understands the pain. And he's feeling that pain with you and with me. But yet he's got the bigger picture. And he says, I'm sorry. You're going to have to walk through this a little bit longer. you got to get purified in the fire. It's going to go a little bit longer. But he hurts for us. And he's not just up there turning levers and buttons and moving things around in this world with no concern about us. No. He has a heart that reaches out to us and weeps when we weep and hurts when we hurt. And so he's standing there with these ladies, with a death of a friend who he was so close to. And that's where we come to the third point, and it says that Jesus arrives when God will get the greater glory. Jesus arrives when God will get the greater glory. This is what you circle and you always keep in the back of your mind. When I pray, I always need to be praying, God, this is what I want, but listen, I want you to get the greater glory. I want you to get the greater glory. And so whatever steps you take, whatever timeline you're on, my desire is you get the greater glory. You go to verse 4, and what did he say in verse 4? When Jesus had heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. You say, well, the illness did lead to death. Yes, temporary, but then he was going to be raised from the dead. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and says, this is for the glory of God. And I will show up, and when I show up, it is so that God will receive the glory. And then you come over to uh, verses 41 and 42. And uh, in verses 41 and 42, when, when he's getting ready to uh, pull the tomb back and he says, I want you to roll the stone back, Martha, the practical one, said, but the body's going to stink. He's been in there four days, uh, four days. Jesus says to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe that you sent me. I want the people to believe that you sent me. I want you to receive the glory. And so God 
That's why we're here today. That's why we chose this day, is that you would be glorified. And I want you people to see the glory. Jesus arrives when God will get the greater glory. And fourth of all is Jesus arrives when your faith will be strengthened. Jesus arrives when your faith will be strengthened. In verses 14 and 15, he told the disciples when he said, let's get ready to go. He says in 14, Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him, that you may believe. He says, I want to strengthen your faith. Guys, you've seen a lot of things over these three years. You're getting ready to see something you've never seen before. Yes, we've raised someone from the dead, but never have we had someone that's been dead for four days. And they've been dead for four days, and uh, we're going, I'm going to go, I'm going to show you the power, the resurrection power. And this is going to strengthen your faith. He gets with those two ladies, with both Martha and Mary. And when uh, Martha's sitting there, but the, you know, the body's going to stink. He says, did I not tell you that you're going to see the glory of God? Get ready. Your faith is getting ready to be strengthened. Now, you've made a strong commitment, made a strong statement in verse 27 about that I am Christ, the Son of God. But I'm getting ready to show you something that you're going to see, a display of the glory of God that is beyond anything that you've seen before. And this will strengthen your faith. Jesus' unexpected arrivals come whenever God can receive the most glory and when at the same time can strengthen our faith. And when he strengthened the faith is when he asked her, he says, do you not believe that he will rise again? She says, yes, at the end of the last days he'll rise. He said, no, you're true on that, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper with you. He says, I am the life. I am the resurrection and I am the life. He says, I am the one who has created life and I am also life itself, eternal life. I am the resurrection and the life. It is trusting in me, Jesus Christ, to give you that eternal life. And he says, and whenever you believe in, in Jesus, it means that death is defeated. And since he is life, those who would believe in him will enjoy a confidence and a power over death known by him. And this doesn't mean that as a Christ follower, we will not die. Yes, we will die physical death unless he comes first. But when we die that physical death, as soon as we take our last breath here, the Scripture says we take our first breath with him in heaven. And there's that immediate transition because he is the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And just as he called out Lazarus and says, you come, and he resurrected him from the dead, same thing happens to us, that when we die, he calls us right to himself. And we spend eternity with him in heaven. And so he's telling this to Mary. He's telling this to Martha. And he wants them to know, I am the resurrection and the life. And in verse 25, he asks her this question. And he says, do you believe this? After he tells her this, he then comes back and says, do you believe this? And that's the question he asks every one of us, is, is do you believe this? And in verse 27, she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. And so for every one of us, we will be confronted with that question. Do you believe this? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that he died on a cross for our sins and was raised three days later? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life? Do you believe when he says that I am the way, the truth, and life, no man comes to the Father except by me? Do you believe that? In the midst of all of her pain, he looks her in the face and looks her in the eyes and says, do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord. Strong confirmation of faith. Every one of us, this is the eternal question that we'll be faced with. This is not just a Sunday school lesson. This is not just a, a sermon where we come and let's hear preach and tell me a Bible story. This has eternal consequences where we have to answer that question, do you believe this? And you get the opportunity to say yay or nay. And you can say, yes, I do. And when you say, yes, I do, and you, you commit yourself to Christ, then all of a sudden his spirit comes to live within you, and you become a child of his. And you live this life with purpose, and you walk through these, these times where Jesus seems to arrive a little late, and then he's, but he's always right on time, and, and there's this shaping and this molding, and he's giving you this incredible purpose in life, and he's giving you a joy that nothing in this world can provide for you, all of these things. <clears throat> and when your day's in, you spend eternity with him in heaven. Or you can say no to this question, say, no, I really don't want to deal with that. 
or I just can't believe that. Uh, just something I don't want to. Then what will happen is you'll continue to live your life tied to the things of this world, trying to get happiness from things that will not satisfy, trying to hold on to some things that will give temporal pleasure, and then after they run out, you look for the next thing, and you've got this up and down roller coaster li life of trying to figure out, trying to find happiness, trying to find satisfaction, and you will not find it. You'll come to the end of your life, and when you come to the end of your life, there's nothing you will have done that's had eternal satisfaction things that almost everything you've done will be burned up when you, when you leave, and when you step out of this world, you'll spend eternity separated from God and not be in a relationship with Him for eternity. Into a place that the Bible calls hell, that's where you spend eternity. And so when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, He's just being really clear that if you want to be resurrected out of death and come into life, I am the only one that can do that. But he gives us all that choice. And it'd be my prayer that you'd make that choice today if you've never, if you've never made that. Now let me give you the final point, and this is that Jesus arrives when he can put you to a higher plane of usefulness. I love this whole account. I really like this last part. Jesus arrives when he can put you to a higher plane of usefulness. You know, when Jesus comes and it's unexpected, why did you wait so late? I've been on this four-day journey. And when he arrives, and when the answers come, then he will take you to a whole new plane of usefulness. Whatever happened to Lazarus? After he was raised from the dead, look at verse 9. It says, and when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, he was at Lazarus' house. So he went to Lazarus' house. This is right before Passover, right before he's getting ready to be arrested. He goes to their house, and he says, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So when you're coming by, you got an invitation. Somebody says, hey, we got an invitation to go by uh, Mary Martha's house and go see Jesus. Most of the people said, that's good, but hey, is Lazarus going to be there? <laughs> and he said, yeah, the guy was raised from the dead, yeah. I'm, I'm heading over there. It's quite an attraction. And look what it says. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Well, let's close with that. All right, thank you all. No, you're saying, well, I don't know. I like that part. Hey, but look at this part. Because, why did they want to put him to death? Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. Now, Lazarus had not had that big of an Im impact before. But you know what? What did he do? He died. That's what he did. He died. And what did God do? God restored him back to life. And all of a sudden, when God restored him back to life, everybody wanted to talk to him. And when they came and talked to him, what was his story? Did he tell them all these great things he did? Did he say, I held my breath for, for four days? Uh, you know, what did he tell them? All he could say was, hey, I was dead. Now I'm alive. It's only by the, faith, by the grace and the power of God that this happened. And you know, folks, this is really all that God asks us to do. He says, I just want you to die to yourself. I want you to die to yourself and say, I can't do this anymore on my own, Lord. I just want to die to myself. And you know when that happens? And God says, okay, let's restore you. And then God's Spirit comes into us. And then God begins to do this new work in our lives. And when he does this new work in our lives, then we intersect people in our sphere of influence and they look at you and they stop for just a moment and they say, something's a little different with you or, or I want to talk to you about this or just like the conversation that Beth had over there where some of them begins to talk about spiritual things. <clears throat> and you know what? When they ask us those questions, isn't it great for us to just sit there and say, well, it wasn't the fact that I got this degree or I did this work or whatever. It's just that once I was lost and now I'm found. It's just the fact that I died to myself. And I understood what Jesus did for me on the cross and asked him to come to my life. And guess what? He's doing an amazing work in my life through the power of God. And that's what we want to tell people. We used to be like Lazarus. I was dead, but now I'm alive. And only because of the power of God. Let me close you with this. And that is if you're walking in one of those four-day journeys seeking a clear word from God in the midst of difficult circumstances, I want to encourage you to keep on praying, keep faithfully following, and know this, 
that his arrival, it'll be unexpected, but it will be at the right time where God gets the greater glory and your faith will be strengthened. It'll be the right time where God will get the greater glory and your faith will be strengthened. He is always there with you providing the strength that you need. But I know that there are times on those four-day journeys when you're saying, I need something clearer, Lord. I need something clearer. And he's telling you, my presence is here, and this is all you need for right now. Some answers will be coming down the road. And when they do, God will receive greater glory, and your faith will be strengthened. And that just takes us to that whole new level of living our life for him. Unexpected Jesus. Look for those unexpected arrivals, okay? Let me ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, it is so difficult for every one of us to have to wait. There are needs that we have, there are wants that we have, and we have all experienced a time where we cry out to you and say, God, I need it and I need it now. And I just thank you so much, Lord, that you are an omnipotent, omnipresent God who knows what is best for us. And I just want to thank you for the no answers or the wait answers you've given me in my own life. And to where if I had gone with decisions that I thought were right or thought that's what you wanted me to do, but yet you put a kind of a stop sign and even maybe in a slow sign down. And then to know that every time that I waited, that it was the right thing to do. And that when you arrived, it was unexpected, but it was just perfect. I want to pray for each one of our, our people that are here today, whether they're a member of this church or not. That, Lord, you help them, especially those that are going through the four-day journey. And that they're looking for you and, and looking for some kind of word of confirmation that today would be that. And for them to continue to walk that walk, follow the path that you've given them, trusting you, knowing that you're always there and that there will be that day of where things will make sense, things will be clearer, and they'll see you in an amazing, glorified, lifted up way. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.